So welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Kevin Bass, who's an MD, PhD student at Texas Tech University Health Center. And Kevin's been a great uh, person to, that, to follow on Twitter for a long time. He puts out a lot of information on nutrition and just really practical uh, things that, that I find uh, to be really uh, effective in terms of just implementing into my life. So Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Mike. I've uh, followed you on Twitter for, it feels like, I think around seven years and I've seen you around for such a long time. So it's like, it's really funny to finally be on your podcast after um, seeing you make actually such a, such a big impact on a lot of different people for such a long time. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm at the Texas Tech University Health Science Center. I'm finishing up with my PhD done my first two years of medical school and I'm about to uh, go back to my clinical years and finish up my clinical training and then you know I'll be a full-fledged uh, MD, PhD, doctor, physician, scientist and I'm excited about that because I finally want to actually uh, put some of this stuff into practice myself with uh, my patients and so yeah no thank you so much for having me here and I'm so excited to be talking about some of the stuff that uh, we've talked about that you're interested in hearing about so yeah so i like I, I said at kind of at the beginning of the show like you just put a lot of good information out there that i feel is very very like implementable and, and and practical and you've also kind of covered a lot of questions that i feel are kind of being put out there in the mainstream and some of them maybe are correct and some of them maybe are incorrect and i know that you're you know very very good and diligent when you you know go through different studies and papers and you're kind of able to tell people, you know, what's real and, and, and what's not. And so, you know, that's again, why I really wanted to, to, to chat with you today. So yeah, I'm just going to get right into it now, Kevin. So, um, you know, a lot of people uh, have seen on the internet over the past couple of years, you know, I know Dr. Sinclair has talked about it quite a bit about metformin and berberine. Uh, so metformin for people who don't know is a very typical drug that's prescribed for type two diabetics uh, in terms of in helping lowering overall hemoglobin A1C. Um, and then there's another supplement called uh, berberine that has similar mechanisms of action. And I think it was in 2008, um, I tweeted out a study that uh, compared metformin to berberine, and it showed that uh, berberine was basically as efficacious as um, as a metformin. And actually, I remember that tweet specifically because Tim Ferriss retweeted it, and then he started following me. So that's probably part of the reason why I remember it. But, um, you know, coming back to the medications and, and supplements themselves, uh, metformin being a medication, bourbon being a supplement, um, you know, a lot of people are taking these uh, prophylactically, I guess you could say, for anti-aging. Like, do you feel that there's any benefit to that? Or do you feel that's kind of something that's um, a little bit more like nonsense and, and, and is not going to be effective? Um, there is there are a lot of reasons to believe that metformin or berberine could help with longevity. Like the most obvious is that it's going to reduce your blood glucose levels, especially if you have pre-diabetes or diabetes, it's going to increase your insulin sensitivity and cause more glucose to be taken up from the bloodstream and less to be released. So your blood glucose levels are going to be substantially lower and that could help your, with your cardiovascular disease risk. Okay. So here's some interesting caveats with that. Um, we'll start sort of at the sort of finale and then we'll work backwards. So with respect to Tim Ferriss, so Tim Ferriss's best friend is, or I should say this, like Peter Atiyah's best friend is Tim Ferriss. So yeah. Peter Atiyah was supplementing with metformin for, I don't know, I think five or 10 years, uh, in order to, uh, you gain these anti-aging properties from metformin, these proposed, these putative anti-aging properties. Uh, he no longer does so, and the reason he doesn't do so is that in several different studies, uh, randomized controlled trials, short term, and I think some longer ones as well, looking at specifically the effects of metformin on uh, helping to increase muscle mass, they've shown very clearly that metformin actually impairs uh, mm -hmm. muscle, mu muscle, muscle gain, so adaptation to resistance exercise, it impairs it, and it may even impair adaptation to aerobic exercise as well. Um, one of the pillars of longevity is maintaining adequate muscle mass, avoiding frailty, uh, maintaining function in the old age, because as everybody ages, and as I think all mammalian species age, we have a sort of a, a hill sort of thing as far as it goes with body weight. You go up and up and up in your body weight until you hit about middle age, and then, you know, 
for humans, it might start in 160s. Your body weight starts to slowly decline. And with that, you're going to lose your muscle mass and slowly your function as well as other systems, your muscular, musculoskeletal system also decline. So one of the ways of putting that off is to maintain large, uh, a substantial amount of muscle mass, as you know. And metformin might actually impair that as opposed to help that. So that's one of the reasons uh, Peter stopped taking it. Another reason is that there's a risk of rare side effects, lactic acidosis. You can get elevated lactic acid levels under certain circumstances, and that can be uh, life-threatening sometimes. And I've had friends who um, have treated patients who are on metformin for these sorts of biohacking applications who end up having actually lactic, lactic they've had lactic acidosis. Um, there is some debate in the literature about that, whether metformin does that to, to what degree it does that, but there is that potential risk where there does seem to be. The last thing I'll say is if you look at the mouse studies, there's the most rigorous mouse study called the um, Intervention Testing Program. The National Institute of Aging runs it. They randomize hundreds of mice to different groups, whether to receive metformin over the course of the lifespan or not to receive it. And they found no uh, lifespan extension effects on mice. And in mice, usually if there's um, some lifespan extension effect, you're going to see a less life, a smaller lifespan extension effect in humans. So the shorter the lived organism, the longer the lifespan as a percentage of the total um, lifespan, the longer the percentage you're going to get. So if you see nothing in mice at all, that's like a really strong signal that there probably is nothing in humans. Now there is some caveats. First off, it's in mice as compared to humans. And of course, mice are different than humans. The one counter argument I would say for that is that, well, if we're talking about these fundamental uh, molecular pathways that are common to all mammalian species, they're highly conserved across different species, you'd think that um, if there's no effect in mice, there should be no effect in humans as well, because they're so conserved, they serve such a similar role, they're going to have a really similar role in the biology of these different organisms, because they're not it's not like you're talking about the neocortex, you know, um, you're doing something to the brain in mice and then you're expecting, you know, a similar change in the brain in humans, whereas the brain in humans is quite different from the brain in mice. No, you're talking about fundamental metabolic systems that uh, probably share most of the same components across the species. Now, the final caveat is in is that in mice, um, they don't tend to die of cardiovascular disease. So if metformin reduces blood glucose and helps to improve cardiovascular risk, then maybe it might be the case that um, since mice tend to have cancer as opposed to cardiovascular disease, whereas humans die more often of cardiovascular disease as opposed to cancer, maybe there could be more of a benefit in humans than in mice. The likely thing that we probably conclude about metformin at this point is that it impairs uh, adaptation to exercise. It carries some additional risks, some of which can be life-threatening. If it has a life-extending effect, it, that effect is extremely small. Um, we should focus mainly on people who have prediabetes and diabetes. They sh might have a s significant lifespan extension effect. But I think in people who are uh, especially healthy, probably a lot of your listeners, um, if there is an effect, it's going to be quite small. And there are a whole host of risks also to think about. So I wouldn't say that metformin, in my personal opinion, is worth it as a longevity agent. That would be my sort of calculus at the end. Okay, well, that's a very, very good and detailed answer. So I really, really uh, appreciate you saying that. And um, say if you were someone who say you had a hemoglobin A1C, and for people who uh, are unaware, that's uh, your measurement of blood glucose over over three months, which is a really good test to, to get. Um, say if your hemoglobin A1C was 5.4, 5.5. So you're like, kind of borderline pre-diabetic, but not really like you're still in a healthy range. Um, do you think there's any benefit in taking that and to, to get it down to say, you know, 5.2 or even 5.0? Or do you feel that like at some point, you know, uh, you got to have a, a reasonable cutoff where you can't just trying to like optimize, optimize, optimize? Like, do you, do you feel like, you know, five, if you're at 5.4, 5.5, do you feel like that's a reasonable target to have? Or do you feel like you should always be trying to get it down to say like 5.0? Uh, that's an interesting question. So, um, I think for some markers, some like, uh, biomarkers, there is a, a point at which it can become potentially too low. A good example is like blood pressure. If you get it too low, you can start causing kidney problems. I'm too, too, too low using pharmaceutical agents. If you get it lower using your lifestyle, it's a little bit different, but for, for blood glucose, 
Um, if you're almost pre-diabetic and you're trying to get it down to like 5.0, I would say if you can take it, your dosages aren't particularly large, they're sort of modest, you're not feeling you know, substantial side effects. For me, I, I uh, when I tried metformin for just a couple days, uh, I, I was like put in bed for, you know, the entire work day. I could not do anything. I felt like I had the flu. For me, I was like, you know, <laughs> it definitely wasn't worth it for me. But if you can take it and it's not causing any significant side effects, and we can talk about this later when we talk about lipids, I take a statin, for example, I have zero side effects whatsoever from a statin. Um, and I'm definitely like, Mac, I'm, a, I'm definitely like an LDL maximalist. Get LDL uh, as low as you can without side effects. Um, I haven't tried to exactly get it as low as I can, but I've gotten it quite low and I'm not having side effects. So if it's supported by the research literature, that is to say if there's a low amount of risks, if you feel okay doing it, and if you're getting your A1C lower and you can't do that otherwise through lifestyle, that I think is sort of an individual choice. I, I would guess that you're probably improving your long-term cardiovascular disease risk by some sort of amount by doing that, especially if you do that over the course of like decades. Um, so that's sort of like an individual choice that people could make. Uh, probably it would be helpful if they did it with the assistance of a doctor, especially a doctor who actually understands these kinds of problems. And a lot of doctors, as you know, uh, they don't, they're not interested in this kind of stuff, but if you can find somebody who is interested in this kind of stuff and will work with you, uh, th that that's kind of like, I would say that's kind of like a personal choice type thing. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much for, for answering that. Um, one thing too, I want to ask you about, cause I saw, uh, one of your tweets, uh, maybe in the last week or two, um, showing that, uh, saunas actually decrease overall lifespan. So, you know, again, um, I know that a lot of, uh, your, uh, follow followers and my followers also follow Joe Rogan, uh, Andrew Huberman, um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, like a lot of people have been promoting saunas for longevity. And, um, you know, I found that tweet that you put out very, very interesting. So like, do you feel that saunas overall may actually decrease their overall lifespan? Or do you feel like they have no effect? And then the other thing that, you know, I know that you mentioned in the tweet, which makes total sense is that most people who sauna every day are also exercising most days they're also eating well they're just you know health conscious people right so that's going to make a big difference in in the outcomes of those studies but um overall kevin like do you feel that there are benefits to longevity for sauna and and if not longevity benefits are there any benefits in, in general yeah um i definitely think there are some benefits in general uh for sure and then there's also some some specific harms apart from longevity but with respect to longevity in particular um my my feeling on it is that it's unclear what sauna does for longevity there's several uh, pieces of evidence that i would cite for this so the first is the piece of evidence often used by rhonda patrick and then huberman um it's this it's, it's a, actually a series of studies coming out of Finland, epidemiological studies, looking at people, as you're pointing out, looking at people who um, do a sauna a certain number of times a week and then seeing, okay, of uh, the people who do sauna more often, do they have a lower risk of sudden cardiac death? Do they have a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease? Do they have a lower risk of et cetera, et cetera? And then they see that uh, there's a dose response relationship where the more you do sauna, the uh, lower your risk of these um, diseases, these, these bad outcomes, and the higher the lifespan. So people live longer whenever they do sauna, according to these studies. The problem with this kind of study is that it's an observational study, as you know, Mike. Um, it's, uh, it's epidemiology. And of course, I think epidemiology is great. I have good friends. Who are, I, for, I, I have many good epidemiologist friends who, um, who we broadly agree on uh, epidemiology's usefulness. It's a critical tool for us to use to understand health interventions. But with respect to this particular study, there are some problems with it that I think people who promote this sauna longevity narrative often overlook. So specifically, as you pointed out, sort of a healthy user effect where uh, people who are healthy are using sauna more often, they're living longer because they're healthy, not living longer because of sauna. But there's actually another really important problem with the study, which is that many of the effects shown in 
the first set of studies, especially the one in JAMA Internal Medicine, they had a, a bunch of supplementary analyses that they published along with the paper. One of the analyses in the supplement, actually I think there's three figures that look at um, different outcomes, shows that among people, okay, so you only get this dose response relationship with respect to sauna and a good outcome when you have hypertension as opposed to not having hypertension. If you don't have hypertension, you don't see the effect. If you have hypertension, you do. If you have diabetes, you see the dose response effect. If you don't have diabetes, then, um, then, you, then you don't see such an effect. If you have a cardiovascular disease, then you see a benefit. If you don't have it, then you don't see it, such a benefit. So there's no relationship between uh, the amount of times you go into the sauna and these outcomes if you are healthy and you don't have these diseases, but there is, um, is a relationship if you have a disease. What does that mean? So one interpretation of that is that it's people with these diseases who have more severe forms of these diseases who just don't want to go into the sauna who are like maybe too fatigued to go into the sauna, who when they, they go to the sauna, into the sauna, it's too uncomfortable and they're like afraid they might uh, like have, have an event or something. So it's the healthy, the, the less healthy people in these disease groups that are not going into the sauna. And it's the more healthy people in these disease groups that are going into the sauna. And so it's not so much that the um, sauna is making people healthy, but the health, the health of the people is, is making them you or is allowing them to use the sauna more often. And that's the interpretation that I have. If we would expect that, um, if we would expect that sauna itself is causing some sort of health benefit, then we should see it in the health, healthy people as well. But we don't see it in the healthy people. We only see it in the sick people in these analyses and these studies. And um, you can control for disease state in some of the epidemiological analyses, but apparently the way that they control for disease state doesn't take into account this particular problem. And that's why, um, that's why this remains a problem. This remains a confounding factor in those studies. So I'm going to cite two more studies real quick, talking about some of the animal literature that we have. Um, one of the studies is that if you overexpress heat shock proteins in rats, you cause rats to express higher levels of heat shock proteins. They don't actually live longer. They live less long because they, there's a higher incidence of cancer for reasons that I don't mechanistically quite understand, but it's a uh, there's one paper that shows this. And then after that point, there was no other papers publishing on overexpression of heat shock proteins in animal models, I guess, because nobody wanted to mess with it after they had this paper that was published in like the 2000s. The next bit of evidence I'll point out is one from one of my friends at, uh, at um, he's, in, he's a scientist in China. He's, a, uh, he's in the, I think, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I think he's in like the the uh, Scottish Academy of Sciences, or the British Academy of Sciences, the Royal Academy. He's also in the United States, uh, US Academy of Sciences. He's a really well-known, highly respected scientist. He showed that if you house animals in an ambient temperature that's substantially higher than normal, they live less long. It's consistent with mm. this whole idea of, uh, of um, ex overexpressing heat shock proteins. And if you house them at lower temperatures, they live longer. So if you're housed at a lower temperature, you live longer. You're housed at a higher temperature, you live less long. So maybe one of the things I joked about with him was uh, maybe uh, I should always turn on my air conditioner to a really low temperature every night, and that's going to help me live longer. Uh, I still haven't tested that yet, but uh, I guess I can't test it just in myself. I need some other controls. So if anybody out there wants to test that with me, we can have some control groups and figure out who's living the longest. Um, I don't know if your so, wife would do that either. <laughs> Huh? I said I'm not sure if your wife would like that either. Being oh like, gosh! Stupid <laughs> cold <laughs> room. <laughs> um. Yes. She. Um. Yes. Um. So. Uh. So. So. Again, but we don't have the actual sauna studies in mice. We don't actually have like, okay, did I subject these mice like every other day to a sauna-like condition, like a brief sauna-like condition, an acute. Uh, exposure and then check out their lifespan. We don't have those studies, so we can't actually say um, that acute intermittent exposures necessarily shorten the lifespan, but we have all of these different pieces of indirect evidence, plus the question of whether there's a uh, actually a real longevity benefit in the epidemiology. All that together makes you think, ah, maybe this whole sauna story, especially with respect to heat shock proteins, isn't as strong as we once 
thought. That said, there are some benefits to sauna. So for example, it does lower blood pressure. So if you go to a sauna on a consistent basis, your blood pressure is going to be significantly lower, which is a really good thing because blood pressure is a really important risk factor for cardiovascular disease, stroke, and also dementia. So there's a reason to believe that through this sort of conventional, um, conventional blood marker of health uh, pathway, one may derive some benefit from going into the sauna. But of course, this reduction in blood pressure is not like huge. It shouldn't cause like a massive benefit. So some of the studies that are saying these massive reductions in Alzheimer's disease risk, et cetera, et cetera, I think, again, are confounded. Uh, but I think there might be a modest benefit with respect to those particular outcomes, potentially, assuming that there's other, as these other pathways like heat shock proteins don't override them and then cause like yeah, you might get some benefits with your blood pressure, but the heat shock protein pathways end up causing you to lose those benefits because overall you do worse. I don't know what the answer is there, but I do know, at least with respect to some conventional blood markers, you have some benefits. Also, as Rhonda points out consistently, uh, sauna does seem to mimic aerobic exercise. So there are some studies looking at athletes who are um, their endurance athletes, if they do sauna, without actually adding any volume to what they're doing during their training, they increase their endurance, they increase their um, aerobic uh, endurance performance. So for that reason, I'm interested in, in sauna because I'm a jujitsu athlete. I know you're very interested in MMA and UFC that said, like I'm a jujitsu athlete and I know that having better gas tank is going to help me out. And I don't want to like, and if I can do that, for like, I don't know. Do, do you do cardio or do you do uh, jujitsu? How many times a week, roughly Kevin? Uh, right now I'm doing jujitsu and rest, wrestling three times a week. So I'm doing uh, mm -hmm. Monday, Friday, I'm doing jujitsu and then Wednesday I do wrestling. And that's just because it's the summer semester right now. And I'm, I'm out of money. So I'm trying to save money by going to the uh, jujitsu and wrestling place at the, at, at the campus, which actually is really awesome. It's a fantastic place. I was just, so my, so my ex-wife lives with my kids in like 15 or 20 minutes away. Um, that gym that my daughter goes to is the gym I used to go to because that was convenient for me going there and then going to the gym with my daughter. But uh, since she's actually, she actually took a break for a while. Uh, this is sort of off topic. She took a break for a while. Um, I decided to take a break and then I went back to this original gym here. We we're just going swimming instead. But um, yeah, so there's only three classes right now. I might add in another judo class on Tuesday, Thursday. I need to figure that out. But yeah, so yeah, but then adding in sauna in addition, especially if like my joints are like messed up and if I, if I can't feel like I can move at all, you know, I can add sauna to get some additional quote unquote kind of quasi training volume and that would be convenient. Now, and finally, here's a, both a risk and a harm, depending upon your point of view. <laughs> There's a reason uh, males, mammalian males, we have a scrotum. So scrotums keep the testicular temperature lower than the core of the body. If, if, uh, if you didn't have balls, or sorry, testicles that descended, um, you know, out of the body, then you would have lower rates of spermatogenesis. Sperm don't like those higher body temperatures. That's why you have scrotum, which is very vulnerable. It's like it's like an evolutionarily bad idea to have one. So the fact that we have one says a lot about the temperatures at which sperm need to be held in order to um, in order to uh, optimally function. Now, here's the thing: they've done studies, or they did a study published a few years ago or they took men, healthy men, healthy Finnish men, uh, they gave them sauna twice a week for three months, uh, and then they looked at their sperm concentrations. So they saw a 75% reduction in sperm concentrations in men just doing sauna just twice a week for three months. So um, that suggests, and, and by the way, the reduction in sperm concentration in these healthy men, so they're healthy at baseline, they weren't like men who are, had impaired fertility, they weren't men who are struggling with fertility, they had healthy amounts of sperm baseline, the sperm concentrations fell to a level that in the observational study suggests that it could impair fertility. So there's a cutoff in the observational studies that say below this cutoff, um, you're going to have impaired fertility. Their sperm concentrations fell below that level. And if you already have impaired sperm con concentrations to begin with at baseline, then you could potentially have even uh, more troublesome effects. Or if you're doing sauna, so like five times a week or four times a week, even if you're healthy, you may have substantially impaired fertility. Now, this is both Kevin, a good thing and a that that's just that can happen in just doing it twice a week. Twice a week, apparently, yeah, yeah. I, it was pointed out to me though in those studies, and it was 15 minutes twice a week. Uh, it was pointed out to me that the temperatures at which that was done was um, higher than most saunas. Most people okay. usually do the sauna, and I can actually yeah. pull this up re really quick as I talk. 
That's um, a, that's quite a bit of that's a drastic reduction. Like it's not like it's like you know five or ten percent, like seventy five percent. Yeah, seventy five percent. That's three quarters of your of your uh, production, right? So I mean, if someone is having infertility issues and uh, and their sauna, you know, they're using the sauna consistently. I mean, that 100%. may be the reason why, you know, which is uh, very interesting to know, but not something that probably gets discussed very much because, um, you know, as we we both know, like most people, you know, just like promoting the benefits of the sauna, they don't necessarily like looking at if there are any, you know, detrimental effects, but, you know, that can be very, very detrimental for someone, for a couple who's trying to to conceive, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're so focused and we get so excited about all of the, the exciting beneficial things that we hear about these different health interventions. Like my philosophy and sort of the approach that I often have is like, as soon as I get excited, I'm like, well, first off, I have like a couple of weeks where I'm super excited. I think I'm going to be given superpowers by taking like nicotinamide, ribozide, I'm able to fly and stuff. And I think that it's the most amazing thing. But then after a while, I'm like, hey, wait a second. Like I'm being crazy. Um, maybe I should think about like the downsides. So then I start like jumping into the downsides and risks. So I think people in general, um, once we get really excited about things, we should also think, hey, but for every good thing, often uh, often there are bad things that go along with it. What are the, some of the bad things we can know so that we can make an informed decision? And so in this particular study, they did two sauna sessions per week for three months, as I mentioned, and this was uh, for 15 minutes, but this was at 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. Is that is that normal that's, or is that that's- that's high. I mean, I, it depends if they're doing a dry sauna. I have an infrared sauna and I, mine doesn't even go higher than 65 Celsius. And, okay. and I find that to be like, it's not that in, intense. Like I've, I stayed in there for 30 minutes at that length. So I don't know. I, I've never been in, did you say it was, it was 80 degrees? 80 to 90. Yes. 80 to 90. Yeah. I mean, I think I could tough out 80 for 15 minutes, but I don't know, maybe not. Like there might be a um, massive like jump, right? Because I'm just used to like 65. So I don't know if I'd be able to actually do the 80, but it's like very, very interesting data and good for people, you know, to know that because, uh, you know, I'm sure there's even just one person listening to this podcast that's, you know, trying to conceive and is, uh, you know, using a sauna and maybe doesn't know this, this information. But um, if you don't mind, just kind of want to move move past the sauna. So yeah. that's cool. But uh, well, this is actually a good follow up question. So I was wondering if you add any salt to your diet or if you consume any salt packs, just because I did a podcast with uh, with Rob Wolf. and I know Rob sells sells salt and all that. But I did a podcast with him maybe about uh, a year ago. So maybe a little bit less. And he did show me a pretty good study that showed that um, you know, people who are consuming six to seven grams of salt a day, um, seem to be living, um, uh, seem to be, uh, living longer, have more optimal health as the, as opposed to people who are consuming, say like three or four grams of salt a day. And then once you got to think around like the nine to 10 to 11 mark, um, you know, things got drastically, you know, worse again, but he was kind of saying, you know, right around like, like six to seven grams a day. And for me, like, unfortunately I've just been like, I'm a big sweater, you know, it's a problem when I'm with, when I'm at uh, jiu-jitsu because, you know, guys don't like rolling with a guy who's, who's super sweaty, but uh, <laughs> so I, I'm a big guy who's, who's, who sweats a ton. Right. So, you know, for me, you know, adding salt packs is probably something that's going to be more beneficial for me, but if you're not, you know, a big sweater, you know, maybe you don't need those extra salt packs. So I'm just wondering, you know, um, if you use salt packs and, and, and what are your thoughts overall on that study that I'm, that, that I'm uh, uh, talking about? So if I'm not mistaken, that study was probably from McMaster and they had, um, I want to say, uh, probably Salim Youssef was on it. And I think there's a couple other people whose names I'm forgetting, but there's a group there that, um, I think it's in 2011, 2012, it came out. I don't know if yeah, that yeah, helps yeah. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm aware. I haven't done, I, I'm very aware of that study. I know that Huberman also cited it whenever he did his podcast episode, which I'm going to, I'm actually going to do a full length, uh, critical sort of analysis on YouTube in the next couple of weeks, maybe even around the time you, uh, this podcast comes out, maybe that will come out at the same time. And it, and it includes this study. It's going to include this study. I haven't uh, dived deep into that particular study yet. What I can say is this. Um, so that's an first of all, that's an epidemiological study. So 
Uh, why is it that people who are consuming six to seven grams per day of salt have better outcomes? Is it because, um, is it because they're, well, so, okay. So you see a similar sort of relationship with LDL cholesterol, for example. So LDL cholesterol, you have um, epidemiological studies that show that at really low levels of LDL cholesterol, you have um, higher mortality. And then whenever you get to like around 100, maybe 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is considered high, uh, you have like the lowest amount of, of mortality. And then whenever you get higher than that, you start getting uh, reduction, uh, increases in mortality again. So it's, it seems to follow a similar sort of pattern. And one of the things I know about the cholesterol observational literature relationship, not having dived deep into the study that you're talking about yet, but one I know about diving deep into those studies is cholesterol, blood cholesterol is also a marker of um, nutrition, uh, uh, robustness. So let's say, for example, you're an older person, you're in your 60s, and you are in that state of your life where uh, you're losing weight uh, at a progressive rate. It's just part of the aging process or even part of the disease process. Um, you, cancer does it, but generally just aging, people often just slowly lose weight as they get older. If you're in that sort of state, your cholesterol levels are going to be lower because um, cholesterol is a marker of nutrition status. So if you're eating less, if you're um, not eating as well, if you have malnutrition, you get lower cholesterol levels. So one of the things I wonder is if in those people who are dying earlier because they have lower cholesterol levels, if it's not just because they're already sort of nearing the end of their life, whether or not they have a disease, but they just might be nearing the end of their life. Um, and then it's non-specifically decreasing their cholesterol levels and it making low cholesterol look worse than it really is. And so when you compare those observational studies with cholesterol to the observational studies, sorry, to the randomized control trial li literature with cholesterol lowering medications, you see very clearly that the cholesterol lowering medications uh, across the board reduce mortality, increase longevity, reduce cardiovascular disease, re reduce all cause mortality. So the observational literature with respect to cholesterol uh, like intervening with cholesterol as opposed to just observing what cholesterol is, uh, is, is it's at odds. And it doesn't matter exactly, it doesn't matter at all what, what baseline cholesterol you're at. You could be at a relatively normal amount of cholesterol. If you give somebody a statin medication, you're gonna reduce their risk of um, cardiovascular mortality and all cause mortality. So there's this whole problem that the randomized control trial literature, it can be different from the observational literature because the observational literature can be confounded by important factors that have nothing to do with the uh, relationship you're looking at. So it may not be in the observational literature that low cholesterol is causing death, but rather something else that ends up causing death is causing the low cholesterol. And low cholesterol is just a marker of poor health. Okay, so let's let's uh, circle back to the uh, salt literature. So a recent publication came out, I want to say it was like last year from China, I think it was like 50,000 people, it was a massive number of people they compared people who ate just normal amounts of salt as they normally would, which is substantially above the, uh, you know, guidelines. And everybody around the world eats, eats salt at a higher level than the guidelines tell tell them to. But they ate like a normal amount of salt. Actually, it's substantially lower than what Americans eat, but it's still uh, substantially higher than the guidelines. And then they said, okay, fine, you guys go keep eating your salt. But for you guys, this group that we're going to intervene in, you're going to get a special salt replacement. And it's going to contain... Um, it's going to contain 25% potassium and 75% sodium. So in, in contrast to 100% sodium salt, you're going to get salt that's basically been cut with 75% sodium chloride by weight. And so once they did that, they then looked at the long, long term outcomes and they saw in the group of people who had uh, the replacement lower rates of stroke lower rates of heart attack, and I believe lower rates of all cause mortality overall with, without any uh, downsides. There were no significant increases in downsides. There was no significant increase in like fainting or anything like that. And as it's known, uh, potassium counterbalances the effects of sodium. So sodium tends to increase blood pressure, whereas potassium decreases blood pressure because it works in the opposite direction in the kidney. And the kidney is sort of the mediating organ for these effects. So what that randomized control trial shows is yes, yes, that decreasing your sodium intake and increasing your potassium intake in this sort of quasi salt substitute actually helps your long-term outcomes. And um, 
um, there's something else I wanted to say real quick, um, which, which is at odds with this observational literature showing that that Sultan takes actually the Sultan takes in that particular study that you're talking about from the master, I think were um, even higher than the baseline Sultan takes of people who reduced their salt in these studies in, in this, study, this Chinese study. Um, it was even higher than that uh, at the optimal more point of mortality. So the question is, is maybe the people who are consuming that much salt simply were in better health. They were consuming more salt because they're eating more food. They're, um, the, um, they're not avoiding salt because they're not having, they're not at risk of cardiovascular disease. They're not like monitoring their health because they're concerned about it. They're simply enjoying their lives and healthy, robust individuals. And that may be why they're uh, have the lowest rates of mortality in that study. Now that's just a story. We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that people in this Chinese study, but I'll add this one caveat, they had a history either of hypertension or of stroke. So that's like the main mechanism through these, which the salt substitute tends to work. Um, they had a, they had better outcomes um, in an interventional study. So we know that that is causal, that caused the outcomes. And of course, this wasn't a uh, funded by pharma. This is just some salt substitute study. Nobody, nobody's going to make a bunch of money off of this, although maybe someday I'll come out with a, with a salt substitute that's exactly like the study that people can buy. Uh, <laughs> but the only reason I would be selling this is not because I funded the study, but because I found the study and then I'm going to try to make some money off of it. But, but that's, so I'm not, I'm just saying that like, um, nobody's pushing these data because, um, there's some conflict of interest. They're pushing these data, they're doing these studies because they're interested in seeing what's gonna help people's health. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say about this. Uh, I think that if you do something similar to what the study said, that is to say you replace 25% of your sodium with potassium, you just like, you cut your salt in that way. Um, on average, if you, if you equate it out over a large enough number of people, you're gonna reduce risk. And I think that on an individual basis, you will reduce risk as well. This is just because when you eat salt, it tends to raise your blood pressure acutely. This probably causally contributes over time if you over and over again to cardiovascular disease. So if you do something like this study did, I think you're going to be better off in terms of your cardiovascular disease. You mentioned salt packs. So I don't take salt packs. I don't think I sweat enough to do so. Uh, I do. So, I do sprinkle like the, this potassium and sodium mix on my food. Sometimes lately I've been like forgetting to do so. Um, I do think with athletes, the equation is quite different. So if you're an athlete and you are sweating a bunch of salt, of course, yeah, you want to replace that. You don't want to like be deficient in salt. And if you're, if you become too deficient in salt, you can uh, experience like negative symptoms, like bad things, bad things can happen. Your body needs to start compensating. You're going to lose sports performance. Electrolytes are super important for sure. But if you're not an athlete or you're not experiencing symptoms, um, I don't think that there's any benefit to adding more. Uh, and if you do add more, if you do insist on adding more though, if you add more salt to your food, if you add, if you take these packs and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of anti-element. I know that Rob Wolf has that company element and I know that Uberman is an affiliate for element for each time uh, people buy element with Huberman's affiliate link, he gets 15%. So these people love element. I think they really believe in this stuff. I don't believe in it. I don't think it's a good idea to, to just take extra salt. But if you do decide to do that, one thing that you can do is drink extra water that will mitigate the effects on blood pressure of these salt supplements. And you'll still be taking in the salt and getting that salt in without maybe as much of the harm. Because we know that if you eat foods that are rich in salt, um, if you don't drink water, your blood pressure tends to spike. That's what the study has have shown. But if you drink ample amounts of water with that food that has that is high in salt, then you're blood pressure doesn't spike. So maybe that might be one mechanism by which you could mitigate potential harms. If you do insist on taking these packs, which I don't think is a great idea, unless you need them. If you need them, it's a great idea. But if you if you uh, aren't experiencing symptoms, I, I think you can go without. So that would be my uh, opinion as an athlete. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's ever been any like randomized controlled trials ever comparing like salt supplementation um, in athletes who don't have symptoms and you're comparing sport performance, if you do come across one of those studies, I would love to see it, Mike, because um, I'm not aware of any, but there might, they might be out there. Well, sure. I really appreciate you, you, uh, you know, getting into detail on that. Cause it's something that I, I wanted, uh, you know, a solid, solid answer on. So thank you so much for, for providing that for me. Cause 
you know, it is, uh, again, it's something that's come up, I think, a lot in the literature recently. Again, you know, I think a lot of people who, um, you know, follow you and, and who follow me have probably, um, you know, come across this and been wondering about that question. So I really appreciate you you, uh, you answering that. So last question, um, and if we don't get all of um, the answer to this question, I encourage everyone listening to go to Kevin's Instagram page in, in particular, also his Twitter, but uh, I just noticed on your Instagram page today, um, you had a part one, you know, why you are taking a statin. So I assume there's going to be a part two and maybe a part three coming out. Um, and that's what I want to, to ask about today. So again, if you guys don't get the answer you're looking for today, go to Kevin on Instagram. Uh, Kevin Bass is, is his handle, I think. Um, and, uh, and and you guys will find a really good answer there. So Kevin, you do take um, a stat and you said that at the beginning of the show or in the middle of the show at one point. So um, why do you take a stat and, and what should be um, the goal of, of people in terms of getting their, their measurement? What's the specific number you think that was would be best or, or optimal? Yeah, so uh, let's start with the with the specific number. So there are three thing, three numbers, three main numbers people are aware of, and we'll discuss the others like very briefly. But there is LDL cholesterol or LDL um, LDLC, and that's the, the main thing that you you can get and you can get for decades now in the doctor's office. It doesn't require any sort of specialized panel; it's the standard panel. And it's usually an estimate, and um, well, it is an estimate. It's an estimate of LDLC. It's not 100% precise, and um, it's good for most people. It's pretty good. It's not the best because it can give you a false negative or a false positive depending upon your metabolic phenotype and your degree of metabolic health, essentially. But uh, it's a pretty good number to start with. Um, but if you want more specialized, and and, and if you want to really optimize. You want to either look at the LDLP, the LDL particle count, or the ABOB. And ABOB is probably better. It's less widely available. Um, so a lot of people will say, go ahead and just use LDLP. And if you have LDLP, it's almost as good as ABOB or about as good. It's very similar in terms of how good it predicts your cardiovascular disease risk. But if you have access to ABOB, that's probably the best because ABOB is the actual part of the LDL particle that is atherogenic. And ApoB is actually on um, particles besides LDL particles, so VLDL particles, that um, they are also atherogenic. So you're going to cover and capture a larger number of atherogenic particles. And with respect to the particular part of those particles, that is um, atherogenic. So that is the best marker, and it's been shown to be the best, or uh, it's either the best or it's comparable to LDL. LDLP with a slight edge potentially over LDLP. Okay, so ABOB is the best thing to look at. One thing you mentioned in your questions you sent to me over email was, do we need to look at uh, like lipoprotein sizes, any other aspects of it? I don't think that um, you need to look at, you know, small dense LDL, large LDL. I don't think that that has been shown. There are some people who believe that it has been shown to be important, but in general, the consensus of the field um, after those people tried to make their case was that uh, particle size is not so important. So I don't think that it's necessary to be too concerned about your particle size. That said, particle size can indicate uh, certain metabolic phenotypes. So if you do have a lot of small particles, it's not that you need to be more aggressive with your LDL lowering or less aggressive. Um, Although I guess if you have more small particles, you might be more aggressive because that tends to indicate a bad metabolic phenotype. So you can decrease your risk by more. It's, it gets really complicated into the weeds and we have limited time. So I want to uh, just mention that if your LDL uh, particle size, so your small LDL increases and as a response to like say taking statins, it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's sort of the, just the one take home I want to, want to point out because the particle size is much, much, much less important than total particle count. So particle count or ApoB count is the most important part of that particular profile. Now, HDL and triglycerides are important, again, for indicating your metabolic phenotype. If you have really high triglycerides, that means you probably just need to lose weight. Um, you need to go on a special diet or, or whatever you need to do in order to lose weight, because that's an indication of some issues with your liver and your potentially your muscle and, and uh especially with respect to, to, to oxidizing your lipids and, and using and your body, using them in the appropriate way. So if you, if you have really high triglycerides, that's not a good thing. And if you have really low HDL, that's, that's not a good thing. But as far as 
And, and so you probably want to be more aggressive with LDL lowering therapy in those cases if you can't you know, normalize those values. But normalizing those values isn't going to take away from the potential harmfulness of having high LDL values. So having high LDL values is independently associated with cardiovascular disease risk, even though those other values like triglycerides and HDL having uh, Low HDL and high triglycerides is also, in its own way, independently associated with cardiovascular disease risk. But you're not going to get rid of all your cardiovascular disease risk just by normalizing your HDL and triglycerides. Great. That said, um, for me, why do I take a statin? Well, so uh, um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of, of death in the United States, even among people who have uh, optimal risk factors, as I do. I have uh, low LDL, lowish, I have like, I have like 100, 110 LDL cholesterol. <clears throat> so Dan, so Danielle, uh, who's a cardiologist, who's, um, she's messaging me now exactly about this, the, the post I just made. Um, even among people who have low risk factors at the age of 45, according to one observational study, no diabetes, no cigarette smoking, although I am a former smoker, um, no high blood pressure, I'm borderline sometimes pre-hypertensive slash not hypertensive, and that's related to my genetic background. It doesn't matter how much weight I lose. I, the lowest I'm ever going to get on systolic blood pressure is going to be about 110 um, over, say, 70, and that's like whenever I'm like starving myself. So I usually hang around like 120 over 80. But even among people who are optimal, they have about a 15% chance of having a cardiovascular event about by the age of um, 80. So that's, you know, that's like one in eight, one in seven chance of having a cardiovascular event. And in those people, of course, they have subclinical atherosclerosis. It's much more prevalent than 15%. I would say maybe like maybe 30, 40%. It would just be my guess. Uh, just because you don't have an event doesn't mean you have subclinical atherosclerosis. And subclinical atherosclerosis can affect your uh, physical function. It can affect your brain function. It can affect your sexual function. And among people who have just one risk factor at the age of uh, 45 can get up to, uh, at, by the age, I think, of 75, of 35% chance of a cardiovascular event. So we're talking a substantial chance of having a cardiovascular event, no matter if you have optimal risk factors or not. It's just sort of uh, something that plagues humans, and I don't know necessarily that I'm necessarily not going to have cardiovascular disease. So the the one way that I can mitigate that risk, and if I do it over a long enough period of time, uh, I think it may be up to a 40 or maybe even as much as a 50% reduction in the risk that I would otherwise have is to take a statin. So I decided to try to start with rosuvastatin and azetamibe. And the reason I did that is because uh, I was gaining a bunch of body weight at the time. I went from like 190 to 210. Uh, and I was like, I was a little bit worried about my bulking up and the, the risks on my heart. So I was like, okay, let's try this. Plus if I try this, then I can walk the walk because I always tell people to take statins, but I don't actually do it myself because I don't need to. So let's go see what happens if I take the statins and maybe it'll also reduce the risks that I'm, you know, because of the stress I'm putting my body under. So I started taking them. And one of the first things I noticed is like my shoulder, shoulder felt like it was acting up. The thing is I had a shoulder injury like a month before. So, um, you know, I thought it was nocebo. I was a little bit worried about it. I talked to my friends about it. I wasn't sure about it but then I forgot about it and kept taking the statins and then you know my shoulder healed because I had a shoulder separation it healed and I've not noticed anything so one of the things I'll point out is a lot of people notice these side effects but they're actually uh, most of them are placebo and nocebo clinical trials have shown this we don't have much more time so I can't talk about this in detail so all this is to say I'm noticing no side effects and the one side effect I noticed was probably just me being in my own head about it. Um, I have like great functioning. I continue to gain muscle. I continue to like crush it jujitsu, get better at it. I like can exercise as much as I want. I don't have joint pain or anything like that. Statins have also been shown to reduce inflammation, all these other things. So I'm super excited about them. I'm even more bullish than I was before. I started taking them just sort of as an experiment. Now I'm like, hey, maybe, <laughs> And then, of course, half the comments on my on my my posts are like, "I'm an idiot. I'm like a stooge for big pharma." But I'm, I honestly think maybe um, everybody should take a statin if they can tolerate it. If they don't have the side effects, if they don't have the symptoms, why not take a statin? And there are randomized controlled trials now giving people what's called a poly pill. It reduces their LDL cholesterol. It reduces their blood pressure. Um, I think they also give an aspirin, and there might be some other. Thing in there they give everybody it's like it doesn't matter if they have cardiovascular disease risk mark markers what they give everybody in the study these medications they see dramatic reduction reduction in cardiovascular events over the course of like five years so if i can see benefits from uh, using medications like even uh, blood pressure medications to get my blood pressure down like maybe 10 points below what it is right now and then 
have my LDL cholesterol and then have my um, have my uh, cardiovascular disease risk be negligible in the long run, man, it sounds like a great deal to me because then all I have to really worry about at that point, assuming I don't have, like, die of an accident or something or somebody on the internet wants to kill me, um, assuming, assuming one of those things, then um, all I have to worry about at that point, which is still a lot, is just cancer risk and basically dementia risk. And so I just knock one out of the out of the park there and then I just kind of focus on the other ones and if there's an easy way to do this why not like use the easy way if there's a relatively side effect way of free way of doing this use it I think the the um the prevalence of side effects has been dramatically overstated for for stat muse and in the upcoming posts that I'm going to be making in addition to that one post I'm going to be talking about some of these statistics in greater detail so people can make the decision for themselves assuming they have a doctor who's sympathetic to it. And my Instagram, by the way, and Twitter and TikTok is also uh, Kevin and Basso, K-E-V-I-N-N-B-A-S-S, -S, there's two N's. Somebody else stole uh, the, the Kevin Bass, and his parents like a bass player, which makes it even worse. He's like Kevin Bass, like the Kevin who plays the bass. It's not even his name, that that dick. So he has the, the handle, so I had, the, I had to add the extra in there in order to uh, to, to have a screen name. So, yeah. Well, hopefully he'll, he'll stop playing the bass and you can take it. <laughs> but, His name uh, is Kevin Johnson. It's Johnson, Jesus. It's not even Kevin Bass. Gosh. But uh, that was a really, really good answer. I really appreciate you, um, you know, telling people that, you know, an April B uh, test is a high quality test because, um, you know, things are different in Canada than the States, but uh, it's basically mm -hmm. free in Canada to get your, your HDL, your triglycerides and your LDLC done. You do have to pay for uh, April B, April A1. You also have to pay for um, a, a particle size test. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's good for people to know that like, hey, you know, maybe you do have to pay for one of the tests, you know, to get, get the April B, but you don't necessarily have to pay for the NMR particle size test, which is which is kind of nice for people to hear, you know. So, I mean, if they if they can't afford it, sure, do both. But if you if you can't afford if you can't afford it, you know, getting uh, you know the free test with the triglycerides, the HDL, and the LDLC is good, and then adding the APO B on top of that, you know, is gives you a pretty good picture overall. So, I really appreciate you mentioning that, and and thanks so much, you know, for everything today, Kevin. Uh, you answered, you know, basically all the questions that that I had. Um, sent to you before and uh you know we went over them in detail and you know i learned a lot today so i'm sure that you know my listeners and your listeners are you know are learning a lot today as well so thank you so much for for, for coming on and uh i guess we got your um your uh your twitter handle and your sorry your uh, twitter handle and your instagram handle up so it's um k-e-v-i-n-b-a-s-s -S -S, correct k-e-v-i in in B A S S. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And and on uh on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, I'll drop a podcast called the Kevin Bass Show. So that's what I'm also trying to build. Most of my like uh a lot of my content is really now oriented towards that. So if you want to hear me as opposed to just like read stuff, you can also check out those. So that podcast. Any other places people can uh, check you out, Kevin, before we uh, say goodbye? That's, that's pretty much it. You can always uh, donate to my Patreon if people find uh, this helpful. And that's the same thing, Kevin and Bass, K-E-V-I-N-N-B-A-S-S. -E -E -S -S. So if anybody wants to become my Patreon, they can do that as well. So that's pretty much it, though. Okay. Well, Kevin Bass, everybody, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I'll be back with another episode soon. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it a lot. <laughs>